I think I first read about John Bell Hood 35 years ago, and it was probably something to do with Hood's military career in the Eastern Theater, probably because he was wounded at Gettysburg or maybe the charge he was involved with at Gaines Mill. Of course, over the years, I became very interested in who Hood was because of his tenure as commander of the Army of Tennessee and then ultimately his actions here at Franklin. I was very interested in who this guy was and then the first time I came to Tennessee, I was pretty stunned. I was really stunned at what people said about him, how he was portrayed. I remember seeing his photograph hanging in the men's restroom at Carter House. It was as if there were two different characters. It was almost as if the hood who had fought in the East was a different person than the one who had fought in the West. I don't know where where the animus toward Hood in this area really came from, but there was something about Spring Hill and Franklin that was really hard for people either to understand or just to accept, and so they had to start building this sort of counter-narrative, and, and Hood was the perfect kind of villain. You know, he'd been wounded at Gettysburg, and then he'd lost a leg at Chickamauga, and he wasn't from here. When you're dealing with the, the legacy and the ghosts, if you will, of people like Pat Claiborne, you know, dies gallantly at Franklin, and Nathan Bedford Forrest, who is really Tennessee's hero, Hood just didn't measure up. Sadly, the narrative started at some point in the early 20th century. He almost became like a character of himself. First of all, he became really just a kind of a dolt. He was an idiot. You know, he didn't know what he was doing, which, which of course isn't true because he graduated from West Point. They started making up nicknames for him that never existed at the time. One of them was Old Woodenhead. Well, nobody ever called him old wooden head during the Civil War, and that he was in love. He was in love with Sally Preston, and so everything that he did was to impress her from a distance. The only evidence of their relationship comes from Mary Chestnut. People who are interested in the Civil War know her as the famous diarist. Well, I've actually called her like the Forrest Gump of the Confederacy because she was everywhere that something interesting and gossipy occurred. And then probably though the most pernicious was that he was addicted to drugs. That, that because of his injuries, he was kind of an opium addict and laudanum, which is a you know, derivative of opium, had clouded his judgment and he murdered his men. Around the time I saw his photograph in the bathroom at Carter House, which actually at the time people thought that was funny, his memoirs were being sold and I found a copy on a shelf in the back and he had horns drawn on top of his head and the orange had like flames above his shoulders and I was really puzzled by this and I know I challenged a lot of people that how could you say this about someone A that you've never met, B who's dead and can't defend himself, and C this guy was everywhere. He fought in probably 12 or 13 really pitched battles. If nothing else he was a soldier and I thought he deserved better treatment. John Bell Hood when the war ended was scar. He'd been wounded in the left arm and, and that had recovered, but his leg was gone. His right leg was gone just below the hip, so he was an amputee. And this man had seen the worst of combat. And I think like a lot of people like him. It, it's one thing to be a rank and file soldier and to have seen it, that's bad enough. But when you're someone like Hood, many of the scenes that you saw were because of decisions you made. The memories of Gaines Mill, Antietam, Franklin don't go away. That's blood on your hands. And I think like a lot of people in similar positions, they went home and they didn't try to, to just forget, they tried to not think about it. And they tried to just live quiet, peaceful lives. So Hood eventually got married. Hood had been baptized as Episcopalian and he married a Catholic, so they had to get a special dispensation, he and Anna Marie Hennon just to be married. He got a job, he worked in the insurance industry for a long time, and actually did pretty well. They lived in the Garden District of New Orleans. Um, they had 11 children, she had three sets of twins. He seemed to be, I think, pretty comfortable with that decade after the war of just living his life. It was intriguing to me because he was one of these former commanders who didn't talk about the sort of virtue of the Confederacy and of the cause. He dies before the Lost Cause is born, but he was one of these young men who I think accepted the outcome. The South had lost. He didn't want to live in the past and he wanted to move forward. That didn't mean he apologized for anything, but he wasn't interested in refighting the war. He gives a speech in the mid-1870s to a group in South Carolina where he tells everyone to avoid any involvement with the Ku Klux, as he put it. So he's telling everyone, the Klan isn't going to be anything positive for us. And while we don't have anything to apologize for, we have responsibilities. And he said chief among them was helping to elevate the Negro. He said that education was paramount. Now, I think that's an extension of this sort of paternalistic 
feelings. Because Hood during the war had told Sherman that, that black people were, were subordinate and, and so forth and so on. But this didn't sit well with a lot of Southerners. They weren't interested in that sort of approach. And I think Hood becomes a lot like James Longstreet and later John Mosby. They become pariahs among those who begin to craft the lost cause. And then Hood's drawn into the literary debate. Joseph Johnston writes his memoirs and, and really accuses Hood of some things around Atlanta that Hood feels his honor requires him to respond. He writes his memoirs, which aren't that good, but they tell Hood's story. They tell it as best I think he could. He's very defensive. Clearly, the Tennessee campaign and what happened at Franklin was still very much on his mind. Maybe it had never left, but he, he brought it back. He tried to defend himself, and then he died. He dies on August 30th, 1879, and his wife had died on the 24th. He had just buried her. They would lose their oldest child, and then he was gone. And then the orphans were split up. They were sent around to different places in the country. I've had the pleasure of meeting several of the descendants through the years. And I can tell you they are very happy with how Hood has been given, I think, justice. I think Hood has been just presented as who he was, a young man who believed in the cause. He certainly sacrificed his own body. He did what he thought was best, even if some of those decisions weren't the best or the right ones. And when it was over, he accepted the outcome. And then he went on. Here we are in 2020. We tell a story every day. This photograph isn't in the bathroom anymore where it never belonged. John Bell Hood is still alive in many ways. There's a fort in Texas named for him. But of course, with the ongoing debates about Confederate iconography, I think it's very likely that Fort Hood, Texas will at some point be renamed. But that doesn't mean that Hood's story changes. Who Hood was and what Hood did here will always be part of at least the story of Franklin.